Hello and welcome to Tales and Trails. I'm Minnie Menon. I'm here at Bikaner House in New Delhi, which has emerged as quite the cultural hotspot these days. It is this old princely palace, which is stately, it is beautiful, it is historic, and it is also extremely relevant at a time when everybody is discussing how best to manage our heritage. It is hard to imagine that even till 10 years ago, the Bikaner House in the heart of Latyan's Delhi was a bus depot for the Rajasthan State Bus Department taking passengers to Jaipur. Built just after the Crown announced a shift of the capital of British India to Delhi at the Grand Darbar of 1911, Bikaner House is one of the oldest of the stately palaces that was built around the India Gate. Important meetings of the Chamber of Princes was held here once upon a time and today it acts as a gateway to Rajasthan as it was among the first monuments to be restored under the state government's plan to develop Rajasthan as a cultural hub. So at a time when the union government is mulling partnering with corporate houses to develop our iconic national monuments, I caught up with Malvika Singh, who is a member of the Rajasthan Chief Minister's Advisory Committee, working in the space of arts, culture and tourism. Mala has been a founder member of INTAC, she has worked on the revival of the Maheshwari Sari with Reva and she has authored many books. Mala, such a pleasure to have you with us on this show. You know, uh, there's a raging debate about uh, the future of our heritage and everybody's looking at it in binary terms, black or white. Now, as someone who's worn many hats, and I think the most exciting thing about you is the sheer body of work you have done uh, in, in the revival and restoration space. I want to ask you, which side of the debate are you on? Well, you know, uh, Minnie, it really is quite simple. Hmm. If one just goes by simple definitions. For instance, I define culture as the man-made heritage of an area, the skill of that area, and the environment, natural environment that you've inherited. If you take those three together mm. and you try and fuse them, you will have multiple heritage zones across this country. Sure. So, uh, let's take Rajasthan. And then I'll come back to the present debate because it's linked directly. In Rajasthan, there is a fort called Nahargarh. Mm. It overlooks the city of Jaipur. It's very iconic. And it belongs to the state archaeological department, not to the Archaeological Survey of India, sure. which has 5,000 monuments at the last sure. time I looked at it. Mm. Those are national treasures. Let's assume for a minute, for the argument. Then you have the state treasures. So if you take Nahargarh, it's a state fort. Mm. There is a palace there that was restored by the state archaeological um, department. And Peter Nagi, who runs an art gallery, said to me, can we, my dream has always been to do a sculpture park, an international sculpture park. So I said, look, I can give you a fort to use as an international sculpture gallery. Sure. Government will give you no money. There will, there will be very strict norms that you will have to adhere to. For instance, you can't knock a nail in a wall because it is a, it is a monument and it's over a certain grade. Um, but if you tell us what you want for the lighting and how you'd like the wall to be put on which you can actually knock a nail and hang something, our Department of Archaeology will work closely with you. Sure. So they agreed. All the money was raised from CSR private funds. All the norms that the archaeological department of Rajasthan put forward were met and the gallery opened. Now, to me, that is an interesting way of adopting partnerships mm. with state governments. Because I think you should begin with state governments and then come to the national level, the other way around. That's my take. Because all the glitches that partnerships and adoptions, etc., may bring to the fore can be rectified and then you move to the national treasures. Mm -hmm. Now, my take on what is happening here. I really think that it should be sponsorship as opposed to adoption. Okay. I know it's a question of semantics. We need to get in our national monuments corporates involved as partners with very specific purpose. Okay. Maintain the exterior lawns. If you want to start a boutique there, create a boutique space and make products to sell that are 
connected to that particular monument, area monument specific, add a cafeteria, sponsor shows in the gardens in the evening so that people start coming and taking ownership of their legacy. You cannot conserve legacies with a blue board. Archaeological Survey yeah, of you India. You know, there are lots of problems in the existing system. No, so, so my question is that, is this an attempt? Is it a desperate attempt to get things done quickly? Because see, my, my point is, is, there is a crisis also over there. You go no, to half you know, monuments. The moment you say desperate, hmm. anything that is a desperate attempt can only fail. You have to do this in a very consistent, thought through manner. Therefore, I'm suggesting what I am. And I'm saying, take the red fort, since that's the controversial position. How can the red fort be taken over by Dalmia Bharat? They're not taking it over. Under a scheme where they're maintaining lawns, loos, uh, public spaces, if they do public events there to generate money, all the revenue must revert back to the department. It cannot revert back to the person who's sponsoring. Otherwise, what's he doing? He's advancing five crores a year. Are you telling me that the government of India does not have 15 crores or 25 crores or whatever it is for five years to look after the red fort? Therefore, I think this desperation that you mentioned needs to be put on the back burner. And we need to go to the drawing board and see how can the corporate bring funds in and partner with state and central government to conserve monuments and to actually maintain them with the revenue returning back into a trust fund that then keeps adding value to that monument. Hmm. Right? Mm. Not into the Consolidated Fund of India and not into the hands of the so private. You know, everybody is talking about that right now. You, you take the Red Fort since that's the point of discussion. Now, the, 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 those who have criticized this move most virulently have said that you're ticketing money from the Red Fort is enough to manage the Red Fort. But only a portion of that comes back to the Red Fort because it goes to this Consolidated Fund, as you say. Now, my point is that it hasn't worked for the last couple of no, decades. No, but it hasn't when, worked because what there was the no intent to make it work, Mini. There were 70 years of everyone saying, we've adopted a system from our retreating colonial masters. We never rewrote that system of how you look after your monuments. What the Brits left us, we, we adopted, right? The Victoria and Albert Museum was a government museum. Today it is not. Today it is a joint venture. Sure. Why is our National Museum not a joint venture? Why have we not re-looked at the mandate that governs our cultural properties? What, when I say we, I'm talking about the government of India. Because everyone has treated culture as something that is really not important, that we must actually just make money and the stock market is more important than the Red Fort. I think with this new generation, there is a return to wanting to generate that sense of pride and ownership of our legacy. Mm. You know, we want that as a background. It's soft political power. It's beginning to be understood. Yes. So the people who are criticizing the, the rather, I think, careless structuring of this idea, which I think is a good idea potentially, are critical of it because they think it will be taken over by these guys who are anyway greedy to grab property, grab land. So therefore, I think the first thing we need to do is go to the drawing board, bring in people from ICOMOS uh, and other agencies, UNESCO, sit down, thrash it out to see how public and private partnership can work. The points Mala make are relevant and the new adopt a heritage policy of the government is just addressing a small part of it. In a nutshell, the policy has identified a list of 93 primary and secondary monuments for which private partnerships have been invited. Private companies will manage the facilities like public cloakrooms, clean toilets, drinking water, signages, Wi-Fi connections, management of the ticketing counters and illumination. There are some checks and balances which ensure that all the work is done within the guidelines of the Archaeological Survey of India. Even the branding of the company will be based on these guidelines. The idea is to get help from private companies to increase tourist footfalls and develop these tourist destinations. 
However, there has been a lot of criticism. I think you, you, you hit the nail on the head when you said it was a careless interpretation of what is happening or a careless communication of what is happening. That's because right. I think I've been through the, uh, the site, everybody has, you know, I've, I've, I've read everything that has been published on the, on the particular move. But what I don't get is why hasn't there been clarity on what exactly the role is going Somebody to be? Somebody has to lead the questioning. Nobody in this country has gone to any government in power. It's got nothing to do with BJP or the Congress or uh, coalitions. Nobody that I know of has gone to government and said, we would like you, Minister of Culture, to sit at the table. We'll call in all these people, three days, closed door session, brainstorm, and create a document. Mm -hmm. Now, this issue of seminar mm -hmm. is democratizing heritage. What does that mean? That means heritage can only survive if you allow people, citizens, to take ownership of their public spaces. In Rajasthan, Chief Minister of Rajasthan, her mandate to our Committee on Arts and Culture was very simple. I want Rajasthan to become a public art gallery, open air. I want ownership back to the people. Government is not going to give you money to do this because the people must participate in raising resource to restore their legacy. Okay, whether it is in skills, in man-made culture, or in the forest sector. Mm. Now, how do you do that? CSR luckily is there, so you have to do a lot of PR, talking to people, bringing them to sites. It requires commitment, passion, hard work. Who's willing to do that? Everyone wants something on a platter. So let's go back to the drawing board. Now that there's this interest, it won't take more than two weeks to work out a mandate. I'm giving you one example. Mm. Change the rules that govern. Remove the black, those blue boards because, look, Bikaner House, we're sitting here, our gates are open. Next to me is the Museum of Modern Art, NGMA. The gates are closed. Nobody goes. <laughs> it's symbolic. So of, every time the... the car goes and I want to see an exhibition, some sort of rather surly guard says, Kaan ja rahe? Tesko milna hai? Said, Numaish dekhni hai. They don't even know that there's something happening in there. So if you keep the gates closed and you expect footfalls, where are they going to fall from? The heavens. I've had to battle with the guards here to keep both the gates open because they're so used to. Now why? State. So state gives money, state takes ownership. State ministers, bureaucrats change. Their attitude, whether it's a priority, not a priority, changes. So everything suffers. The moment you open this thing up and say the state will not give money except play the role of a landlord. The state sure. is the landlord of the property. Now you take this 10 to 5. Every national monument under the ASI opens at 10 with somebody sort of coming lolling there and sitting at the gate most disinterested in the monument, in the environs and they close at 5. Now please tell me if you're working, when you take your children to see a monument, you have to keep it open from 9 in the morning to 7.38 in the evening. And especially in countries like ours, where the days are so hot in the summer, and that's seven, eight months. No, it, it requires a complete so rethink. It, it requires a complete rethink. Of but systems, I'm... mandate, and partnerships. Okay. I feel that right now, finally somebody is thinking about it, opening up, talking about it, and there is action. Now, how the action should be translated into actuals no, is I, what... I think there's a danger in this. Hmm. I think this quick thinking, quick action, desperation may falter to the point where it will stop forever. And you'll have another 20 years where everyone say, no, this is a sacred cow, we do not touch this. Okay, but let's step back a little, uh, Mala, and you were part of INTAC, you were one of the founding members of INTAC. You know, the movement was great, it was pan-India, it was really a very robust movement. Uh, but you know, since then, of course, there have been many attempts to try and look at heritage. But when I go back, and I've been traveling across the country looking at monuments, what is appalling is the state they are in. There are no signages, there is absolutely nothing, there is, you know, the ASI doesn't have the money to manage these. Where do you think the problem lies? Really? Now, you know, again, you have to go back to the drawing board. There's the problem I told you is very simple. It was on the culture, was on the back burner. If you have a ministry of culture, 
it should be arts, culture, archaeology and tourism under one head. Those ministries, departments should be disbanded to come together under a new umbrella where each of these are interrelated. Otherwise, you're going to get nowhere, number one. Number two, in signage. It is critical. Nobody believes that we need to change the signage of the 1950s. Advertising has changed. If you look at the ads then and the ads now, why don't we change it? Because it's in the hands of government. Had it been in partnership, it would have changed. For instance, Rajasthan, when this mandate was given to us, in four years, we have transformed 18 museums, government museums. They look like any good museum in Europe today. And where are they? In Chitorgarh, Sikar, Pali, Jhunjunu, places like that. These are not metropolitan towns. And people have started going there because you're giving them izzat in their regional cultures. They are going there because they feel a sense of pride and ownership. It is critical. Please understand if government superimposes, people don't want that. Nobody, no child wants to be superimposed with ideas that parents are giving them. They break loose at 18. I think you need to get out there, you need to talk to people, you need to convince them, excite them, motivate them, bring some young people in who are exciting. Every one of the museums in Rajasthan have been redone by people under the age of 45 or 50 max, right? They're sparkling. Hmm. And you can look at them, you can take a trip and go and see them. And they're open for the public. Those people in Bharatpur are so proud today of it. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to vote for this government. But their pride in their own thing has generated, and that's what's important. It gives people izzat. Indians have been treated as, you can come at 10 and you can leave at 5. That symbolically is saying, this is mine, not yours. And you will come on my terms, buy a 2 rupee ticket, come in and leave when I tell you. Mm -hmm. You don't do that. You let people float in, float out, and slowly they realize this is theirs. Getting local communities involved in their heritage has been the best way to preserve it the world over. In India too, governments must work towards this so that our heritage can be saved. A misstep could worsen the already bad state our monuments are in and do irreparable damage.